I was wondering, Suzanne, if you would like to take us to a land acknowledgement before we started. Sure, absolutely. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional territory that we sit in. This is Williams Treaty Territory. So that involves five area First Nations, the Chippewas of Georgina Island, uh, Mississaugas of Scugog Island, Alderville First Nation, Rama, and Curve Lake First Nation. This is all Williams Treaty Territory. And we also sit on the boundary line of the Dish with One Spoon Territory, which is the Mississaugas of New Credit and part of the Toronto Purchase. So this was an actual trade route from Toronto through York Region up to Lake Simcoe. Um, so acknowledging the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, the Huron-Wendat, and also the Haudenosaunee people um, of this traditional territory. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so it's so nice to have you as our very first guest in Food Stories. Um, so, um, I just wanted to start by just a quick introduction of Suzanne and then maybe you can kind of take over and let us know a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Uh, so this is Suzanne Smoke, um, Gnu Kwe, Golden Eagle Woman. She's a member of the Mississaugas of Rice Lake, Alderville First Nation, and she sits with the Bear Clan. So that is just her, uh, her title, but I know there's lots more uh, to you. And I was wondering if you could just start by sharing sort of uh, who you are and what what you do. Sure. Um, so I live and work here in York Region. I've lived here for about 23 years. Uh, my daughter is a band member of the Chippewas of Georgina Island. Um, I run a not-for-profit in my part-time volunteer uh, hours, uh, Bend Again Healing and Arts, which is a not-for-profit here in York Region. And we basically fill gaps in services where needed. So we do a food box program. We do clothing exchange and clothing drop-off. Um, I work as accompaniment for um, uh, assaults or violence through hospitals, policing, uh, victim services, things like that. My full-time role right now is I work in anti-human trafficking, domestic assault, and sexual assault. Um, I work full-time with Muskoka Perry Sound Sexual Assault Services, and I work uh, doing outreach trying to uh, create a safety network for women uh, that are finding themselves on the streets in Toronto and victims and survivors of human trafficking. Um, a lot of the, um, over 51% of all victims are Indigenous um, here in our territories. And we know that a lot of them come from the Northern communities, um, coming down to these inner cities where there's a lot of bias and racism and, and just, uh, it's a really rough place for a lot of our young Indigenous women. Um, so just, that's the work that I do full time. Um, and in my spare time, I'm a foodie. I like to do the food and um, food is so healing for us. And um, I'm very much a naturalist in that everything that we need to survive Mother Earth has put here for us. So before walking into a pharmacy or anything like that, I'm more apt to walk into the bush and find those medicines and those teachings that I have and, and utilize those every day. So um, yeah, I'm a medicine person within my community. Um, I've been walking this road for about 35 years and feel like I know like this much compared to some of my elders and teachers and people that are out there in my community. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I know that Mother Earth provides everything for us. So um, my main staples uh, here, like we have four traditional feast foods within this territory, um, corn, uh, wild rice, um, fish or wild game, and strawberry. Mm -hmm. Those are our okay. four feast foods. So um, I'm a ceremony woman. I'm a pipe carrier within my community. I'm a knowledge keeper. Um, so every time we're doing anything or any kind of gathering, we feed ourselves and we feast and we also feast spirit. So there's a whole teaching around that spirit plate when I'm uh, cooking for community. Um, we don't sample the food while we're eating, which is so different if we're cooking for like, you know, catering or, or at home for our families, we'll taste and we'll do that. When we're cooking for ceremony, when we're cooking for lodge or in spirit, um, we put a feast plate out. And what that feast plate is, is everybody that's cooking something for the day, we would take a little piece of that food from every plate and we would create a feast plate for that. And then we would sing for it. We would offer our tobacco, our sema, which is like traditional tobacco, not like cigarette tobacco. Um, and then we would offer a prayer and then we would go put that out somewhere um, in not a highly trafficked area. It would go out in the bush. Sometimes we'll put that uh, into the water um, and we're feasting spirit. We're feasting the ancestors and the people that have come before us. And that's, so a, huge is, part of, that's a huge part of our, our food and our connection to spirit. 
Well, this is amazing. So you just given us like, <laughs> you just downloaded us with so much information. If anyone has any questions, if you look, um, if you look at the bottom of the, your screen, you can pull up the chat. Um, and so in that chat, you can just fire away questions. And as we're talking, then I can ask Suzanne any of those questions. Um, yep. Like if there's something that um, we want some clarification on. So let's unpack a little bit about what you just shared with us because you just gave me like a full feast myself in hearing that. That was amazing. So let's back it up in the beginning. You talked a little bit about, um, was it the, is it, is, is it called the four sisters that corn our or four, is that something different? It's, it, there's something different. So we have four feast foods for okay. us as Anishinaabe people, okay. um, but we also have the three sisters that the you and I talked sisters. about. So three sisters are planting um, the way that we plant. So that comes from the Haudenosaunee people. So I learned this from uh, my brothers and sisters in Six Nations. Um, we grow our corn, beans, and our squash together. So the, the corn grows and we plant it with the beans and the bean stalks actually grow up the corn stalk for stability and the squash is that foundation and that base to hold the roots in place and to protect the roots so okay. we can grow corn beans and squash together and there's teachings around that and it's called the three sisters so we actually have dishes called three sister soup which is corn beans and squash soup um, but there's layers upon layers of teachings with the Haudenosaunee community on our connection to those foods yeah, see, so that, that sounds really interesting to me. And when you say beans, like what kind of beans are you referring to? Um, there's a number of different beans. Like we use bush beans, uh, garden beans. So um, in Six Nations, I think they use a lot of the white beans and stuff for their soup. So yeah, people just, it depends on the varieties. Like I've been buying heirloom seeds from the Cherokee Nation. I have those glass gem Indian corn. I'm not sure if anybody's seen those. They're just stunning and beautiful. I was trying yeah. to figure out how to put pictures on here and I don't know how yet, but I will put them <laughs> up later whenever we come back. Um, but yeah, so I'm doing the glass gem Cherokee corn, which is Indian corn. Um, is that the one with the multiple colors? Yeah, it's like, like and they're beautiful. Like uh, they're almost translucent, clear blue. They look like gemstones. Oh, amazing. So I'll send you a picture and then maybe you can post it on the Food Network wall. And then I also have, if I can find it here, I've got a few things I'll set aside here. Um, I also have like just the regular native corn that we use, like they call it Indian corn. People decorate okay. it hol at uh, holidays and stuff with it. We right. actually, I lime my corn in hardwood ashes mm -hmm. and I rub it down and then it puffs up into like this nice thick, it looks like hominy corn. Um, and that's what we use in our soup. So those corn okay. husks that people put on their doorways we cook yeah with, i cook with those i soak them in hard so you soak food. them when you soak them does that hydrate the corn that it then becomes edible yes absolutely okay yes. okay yeah. so, and hardwood ashes creates like the process so we sift the ashes so at my house i have like a big basic fire in my backyard that's like a closed in fire and we use that for burning brush and and different things but also in my yard i have a sacred fire and there's okay. seven grandfathers, seven stones around that. And so people offer us medicines, people offer us tobacco ties, and I'll talk a little bit about those tobacco ties and what that means. Um, but we offer our tobacco or our sema into that sacred fire when we're holding a feast. If there's any food left over after the feast, it goes to the fire. We don't waste okay. any food. We would never throw it into the garbage. We would, so we have that sacred fire that burns that okay. I light every so often, probably almost on a weekly basis to take care of spirit, to take care of the medicines, to take care of the foods. Mm -hmm. um, and so I make sure that every aspect of the food that we're honoring it from the beginning to the end. Okay. So, yeah. That's a, that's a wonderful uh, thought process. Um, just, you know, do you want to expand a little bit more on that thought of honoring the food from the beginning to the end? So can you share a little bit about like, what does that look like for you? Sure. So I think one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because I really want people to understand that we as Anishinaabe people, we as Red Nation, um, have a, such a connection to the land and to spirit and, and to creator. And whatever that belief system is for anyone, whatever, whether you believe in God or, or whatever it is, we all have a higher power. We all have that great mystery. And for me, we're really connected to that. And so our food that comes from Mother Earth is a gift. And we okay. always acknowledge that. So for me, um, I plant my own sema. Um, I grow my own tobacco. Uh, there's mm -hmm. no chemicals. It's all organic. So before we take anything from Mother Earth, we have to offer a gift. 
And so okay. for us as Anishinaabe, we offer our sema. We uh, sing for that tobacco, we pray for that tobacco, and then we'll um, go and greet the medicines or the foods. Um, even when we're hunting, when we're fishing. I'm a fisher girl. I'm out on Lake Simcoe all the time usually. So before I even go out to the lake, I take my sema and I pray with that sema and I put it out um, for safe passage for everyone crossing the lake, for safe passage for all the people that are utilizing the lake, but also uh, I'm praying for all of that swimming nation that the impact of all of the fishing and all of that stuff that we are acknowledging and honoring that swimming nation because they do so much for us. So for I me, did, it's yeah. about just being really grateful and acknowledging that everything that we have has spirit. Those plants mm -hmm. have spirit, um, that fish has spirit, those four leggeds when we're out hunting, um, we have to be thankful and we have to live in harmony and balance. So even in our trap lines in the north, we have indigenous families that have lived on the same beaver families for generations. They're not depleting resources. They're not wasting. Um, they're not over hunting. They're not, you know, those kinds of things. So the same indigenous families living off the same beaver family for generations. And wow. that's in balance and harmony and being respectful and knowing when to harvest and, and also utilizing every part of the food um, or or whatever we're taking so for for me for fish we eat our fish we use our bones um, in our gardens or or we actually grind them there's medicines that we can do for, um, they're especially good for women who are pregnant or carrying that new life should be eating lots of pickerel from the territory that they're in because there's teachings around that pickerel and the calcium and the territory from which we come okay. um, for myself I'm from wild rice territory um, Georgina Island is a rising community or was a rising community before the Trent Severn waterway system um, changed those waterways. So for me, I'm very connected to wild rice in my community. I come from Mississaugas of Rice Lake. Um, okay. so our teachings go back to creator that the Anishinaabe would go to seven stopping places where the food grows on the water. And for us, okay. that is wild rice. So wild rice. Alderville is wild rice community. Georgina Island was a wild rice community. So efforts are being made that we can reintroduce wild rice to this territory if we can, but we're not sure because of the water levels, uh, the boating and, and influx of uh, people on the water. So just okay. looking at those efforts. So just always being really connected and understanding that we wouldn't have any of this with, without Mother Earth and without Creator and that we have to be really um, living in balance and we can't be over consuming and, and con uh, even when I'm picking medicines um, like I'll go and I sing to that plant I introduce myself in the language I get down on the ground with that plant um, one of my elders told me when you're picking medicines or you're harvesting foods think of the children that were in residential school and he said when the black coats would come in and take the children they would just take the children and grab them and, and walk out and imagine the fear and the unbalance that those children felt. And he said, yeah. so how are our medicines going to work for us if we just go in and we just snatch them and tear them from the earth and we walk away with them? Right. So I've always thought about that um, my whole life growing up, like we have to really take care of these medicines that take care of us. So um, I get down on my knees, I introduce myself in the language, I give thanks for this beautiful healing that you're giving us. I give thanks mm -hmm. that you're giving yourself of us. And not only do I pray to that plant, I'll pray to all the other ones because their root systems are connected and they're right. all connected. And especially with our standing tree nation, all of those roots under the ground are connected. So that's a family. Um, so I pray to all of them because they're all connected. And then I'll mm -hmm. take just a little bit of medicine from that and leave all the rest so that it can always flourish and grow. We never deplete a whole area from, yeah. from where we're harvesting from. And that goes with hunting, trapping, picking medicines, um, harvesting and foraging foods. We're always very right. conscious of that. You know, so I hear the, uh, like the sort of at the root of your food story is gratitude, respect and connection. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be the main foundation of your food story. And it's interesting that you made that parallel between, um, in your words, the black coats taking the children. Because mm -hmm. as people, we too flourish when we're in this situation of gratitude, respect, and connection. Um, so it's, that's an interesting lesson. Um, and uh, it just kind of like highlights the work that you do and, and it just shows that sort of, how, why would you even go in those areas? Um, so, you know, thank you for sharing that piece. And it's just like, a, that's a little a nugget for us all to kind of consider as we sort of move forward. 
-hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, wild rice. So yeah. you mentioned wild rice. So I'm curious. So I um so I know that rice grows in rice paddy fields, and here we have some here. Did you want to share um sort of about wild rice? Um, it's actually not a grain, isn't that correct? It's a grass. It, yeah, it's a grass. Yeah. So did you so, want to share a little bit about it, and then the harvesting of it, and oh, there we go. As I drop them into my laptop, but that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this was harvested in Curve Lake First Nation. Um, so there's a young man there that um, actually is bringing all the traditional practices and he's actually planting wild rice um, around the uh, local area of Williams Treaty um, because mm -hmm. it was over harvested um, back in the late 70s. Um, we had done um, protection efforts within our communities to sustain the wild rice, but with the fluctuating water levels, it was eradicating the rice beds. Um, and so our communities were working at preserving it. And some of the elders within our community in their um, beautiful minds, uh, many years ago, they took some of those originally seed, original seedlings and planted, replanted them, mm -hmm. some in Ardock and some in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and so each um, harvest season, um, youth from our territories as well as Curve Lake um, come together and they all harvest r wild rice together in our canoes with, with the winnowing sticks. Um, there's no commercial harvesters or anything like that. Um, back in the late 70s, the Ontario government issued wild rice licensing and harvesting to non-Indigenous people and they came in with the big harvesters and were clear cutting the rice okay. from our territory. So there was some um, issues around that many years ago, but they did eradicate the wild rice in uh, Rice Lake and in Georgina Island. So looking at those repatriation efforts around that. Okay, so can you just clarify, so when they came, um, like they harvested everything, is that is that what you're... They came in with like the big, they look like big combines that go across okay. the water and it just clear cuts all the rice. It just cuts everything down. And then they were also pulling up rooting beds and things like that. So they were really like just decimating the rice beds. Oh, um, okay. Harvesters. And they gave license to those people to come in and do that. So mm -hmm. um, we didn't have a voice at that time. Um, or if we used our voice, it wasn't really listened to at that time. Um, but, and also when we look at the Trent Water, Trent Severn Waterway System. It's a great piece of technology and mm -hmm. it's a gift um, of movement of harnessing that uh, sacred navy, our, our water. Um, but if they had worked with the First Nations community in those territories, then we could have made efforts to sustain those rice beds and preserve them um, and look at ways of, of working together. And that didn't really happen back then. So now it is um, working with the Ministry of natural resources, working with our elders and our knowledge keepers within the communities to try and repatriate those back. So that's great. It's really important because it is one of our traditional feast foods all across Turtle Island, that wild rice, like yeah. we know the seven stopping places. So there's a book actually um, mm -hmm. called the Mishomas book and it's by Eddie Benton Benai, who is a Medeoan uh, lodge keeper. He is a Anishinaabe man. Um, and he has a book out called the Mishomas book and it's almost like a children's storybook but it mm -hmm. actually talks about our creation stories. It talks about the wild rice. It talks about our feast foods. And he does talk about manamin. That's what we call it as our manamin. And it's a sacred feast food. And so can we have that, that title again. Sorry, can you share that title again? The sure, it's, I'm going to actually type it into the chat, but it's called Perfect. the Mishomas book. So okay. Mishomas is our grandfather. Okay. Yeah, this sounds like a wonderful resource. Um, you know, often I find that when it's a subject that that's new to us and we are um, learning, if we do read it in a children's book style format, it's much easier for, for us to retain the information and then move forward to learn further. Absolutely. So and I yeah. think, I think mm -hmm. that um, images and media for the past 500 years have really negated the voice of Indigenous people and this knowledge base that we do carry. Um, mm -hmm. We have a connection to the land and the water, our ceremonies, our teachings, our language, everything is tied to the land and the water. Um, yes. I think that uh, when settlers and Canadians were arriving here on our shores, there wasn't a knowledge or understanding of the wisdom that we carried and our connection to the land base. And that voice was really lost. So we're seeing, you know, um, overconsumption, we're seeing these depleted areas. And I think, you know, it's time for to hit reset. It's time to reevaluate 
um, and change the conversation. And I think Canadians need to reevaluate what they've been taught about who we are as Indigenous people, because mm -hmm. we're magnificent as a nation. And we have this traditional ecological knowledge that is so valuable to, especially right now during COVID, you yeah. know, our, our Indigenous nations people, um, we're going to be the hardest hit because we don't have clean drinking water in our communities. We're yeah. overcrowded. We have less housing. Um, all of these are impacts of colonization. Um, but we have our medicines. We have our traditional yeah. ecological knowledge. We know those medicines that are going to clean the air. We know those medicines that are cleaning our respiratory and our airways. So it's really important in understanding. And I think Canadians need to understand that what they've been taught about who we are for the past 500 years isn't who we are. And right. I think that's part of that whole reconciliation piece that Canadians are talking about you know um, I hear a lot that people you know how can we help you people how can we help you and I think educate yourselves as settlers and Canadians about who we are as Indigenous nations and how magnificent we are because that's not the story that they've been told and yeah. you know looking at the traditional ecological knowledge um, you know my phone's been ringing off the hook since COVID about my knowledge around medicines about my knowledge around these food systems um, those same people 10 years ago or 15 years ago weren't hearing the voice of an Indigenous woman in Canada. So yes. understanding how valuable it is now, um, that's how Canadians need to really understand that, you know, in the next seven generations, which is our gift of vision as the Native people that we look for the, forward to those next seven generations, do we have food sustainability? Do we have clean drinking water? Do we have all these things for our children? And I think all Canadians really need to worry about in the next two or three generations when we turn that tap of water on is that water going to flow and is it going to be clean and right. we've been dealing with that for 500 years in our communities um, through colonization but I think it's really hitting Canadians hard this isolation uh, lack of supplies um, even the thought of um, just prior to all this crisis there was um, some things happening around the pipelines um, people were all panicking about they may not have supplies but we never really saw that anybody went without but the thought yes. that they might go without caused all kinds of dissension across canada and nothing was really ever slowed down or stopped in the sense that people didn't have food now all yeah. of a sudden you know a couple of weeks everything's flipped and canadians are really understanding isolation lack of proper food and sustainability around that like if we look at our grocery stores and all around us things those resources are starting to deplete we're, we're, yeah. we're kind of lucky here in canada that it, we haven't been hit as hard but i work and have a lot of family and friends in the u.s they don't have that um sustainability and and there's a real vulnerability that's happening to the um human nation there right now and mm -hmm. we as canadians really need to be aware of food shortages and mm -hmm. what are we doing in our homes you know, we've got these beautiful bright green lawns and, and keeping up with the Joneses next door, but you know, how much of that could be used for food sustainability and growing our own gardens and looking after our neighbors. And like I've, you know, we bought food boxes and yeah. um, you know, I went around and checked on my neighbors and elders in the community and some of our young people that are really struggling with this whole isolation and no social media and all that, um, making sure that they're taken care of and, and taking them food and taking them traditional medicines and those wild rice things. So I think yeah. Canadians really need to look at food sovereignty and sustainability and understanding that the voice of Indigenous is going to be a big part of that teaching and that knowledge base. I agree. And, you know, you really hit on some good points there where the situation has definitely highlighted a lot of those things. And, um, um, at a, you know, it's always kind of like at a tragedy, we can always learn. And I think this is sort of the learning that's now starting to come to come up uh, for people. We've been all talking about food sovereignty for, you know, decades. Um, but what, what's the action that's been done? And so, what, you know, walk a mile in someone's shoes and then all of a sudden we see like what, you know, we start thinking more creatively of what, about what we can do about things. Mm -hmm. um, and you just kind of re you just brought that uh, piece of connection up once again, and just uh, being mindful of our neighbors and and people in our circle, um, and even not in our immediate circle, but just in our surroundings. That um, that important for that community and that connection, mm -hmm. um, and for sure, like um, I know that that uh, isolation piece has been like a common thing with amongst First Nations folks, and so. Um, we can all now experience what a struggle that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th just thanks for sharing that as well. Thank um, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got some good nuggets here. I'm just wondering, uh, does anyone have any questions so far for Suzanne before we continue to chat a little bit further? Um, before we have we continue to chat a little bit further, anyone have any questions? Okay, I don't think there's anything. You're giving us lots of food for thought. Okay. So I can talk a little bit unintended. about wild rice. Um, yes. So I also cater on the side. I don't really advertise my catering because my daughter, my daughter's actually um, a student in George Brown under culinary, and she actually works for. Um, a huge food market in downtown Toronto. So her whole life, my daughter, um, some of you may know her in York region. She's a jingle dress dancer and a fancy shawl dancer. She's also a traditional woman at the age of 21. Her <laughs> English name, her decolonized name is Cedar Smoke. Um, her, her spirit name or her Ojibwe name is Ogomagi Shigokwe. Um, her whole life has been spent in ceremony. She was born in ceremony. Um, she has many elders and teachers. Um, we travel all across Turtle Island. Um, and part of that, again, is always feasting. Everywhere we go, every ceremony, we feast and we feed each other and we nurture our spirit through the food. Um, so Cedar and I cook a lot together. And um, when we are traveling for ceremony, there's sometimes where we go up in Northern Ontario into the middle of the forest and we build our lodge. And sometimes there's 20 people, sometimes there can be 150 people. And all of us gather and we feast and we pray and we sit and lodge for four days. And when we leave from that territory, there's no impact because everything we've taken from the earth, we put back in a good way. If we cut saplings down for our lodge, we're planting saplings as we take those ones down, we're planting one in its place. So feasting is a huge part of who we are as Indigenous people. So for me, when I look at our wild rice, um, I create it in so many different ways. So we do all different wild rice puddings. Um, we boil it for about um, 40 minutes and it opens up into this nice, beautiful, like puffy, um, nutty kind of uh, flavor. And so we do all different wild rice dishes. So we do wild rice with dried cranberries and we mm -hmm. soak that. Um, and then we also do it with um, all of our, like cranberries are water mohawk territory. So we go to the water mohawks and we trade our rice and we trade it with cranberries. So then we also do like dried foods with wild rice, cranberries, and different meats. Um, okay. almost like an old style pemmican, is what, but it's like a high fiber. So we have a lot of people that travel in the bush. They're out fasting. They're out doing things. So this is more like sustainable foods for them. Um, drying foods. Um, and one of our favorites here at our house, and we do it all the time, is uh, wild rice maple syrup. And I get my maple syrup from Georgina Island from First Nations Cultural Tours. So okay. they do all the old traditional smoked um, syrup. They don't have any oh. evaporators. It's not, not any of the new technology. It's actually Jacob Charles Nanokashi um, okay. from Virginia Island, and he has his own smoked maple syrup. So mm. I actually bought a case from him this year because, you know, our, our syrup times, it's like gold in our communities, right? Yes, I don't that do sounds like gold. Sugar. Yeah, I don't do any white sugar. Um, I do, I, I uh, sweeten with all natural. So maple syrup. And I also get my honey from Georgina Island. They have Georgina Island Honey Company through Darla Trumbo. Okay. Um, so I buy organically. I buy local if I can. I buy and sustain from the local First Nations if I can. Um, oh, and that's where I source. Same with my wild rice. Um, we get this, like I said, in Hiawatha, First Nation, uh, Curve Lake. And uh, Alderville has some, but it's not like harvested from that area usually. Um, but mm. Curve, Curve Lake has quite a bit. Um, so we do wild rice, maple syrup, and cinnamon, and then we top it, we bake it in the oven after we've mm -hmm. boiled the rice, um, and then we top it off with fresh strawberries and more maple syrup. So it's a beautiful dish, and that's kind of our main staple in our feasts. Um, so wait, I need a little bit more detail about this dish, because that sounds amazing. <laughs> well, and I was hoping to, I was hoping to kind of do like a cooking demonstration, but we're actually my lighting just went in my kitchen. So I have like a lamp on my counter. And <laughs> it's not, this isn't conducive to my kitchen. Usually I have a nice big kitchen, in, but not today. Um, but yeah, so I boil my wild rice and okay. then I have a big chafing tray and I um, season it with cinnamon and maple syrup. Mm -hmm. And then I just bake it like that. And then we top it with fresh strawberries and I glaze my strawberries. I cut them all up ahead of time and I just pour a little bit of maple syrup so it gets the natural sugars. And yeah. then I pour that on top and then even just a touch more of maple syrup. 
So it's all natural. Everything's all natural, organic from the earth. So you are speaking to my soul right now. Okay, but I have a question, Suzanne. Do you, would yes. you like to take a question now? Okay, sure. so it says, it says uh, Hi, Suzanne. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge and information. So, so important. Really appreciate it. My question is I'm wondering if you have any specific ceremonies related to seeds and planting. So, this is coming from Jessica. She's actually our urban agriculture coordinator at York Region Food Network. And uh, we just love talking about seeds and just food and origins. So, this is a great question. What do you have to say about that? Absolutely. So, again, our seeds are like gold. Um, we're always um, reharvesting from each season. We have a planting ceremony that happens around, usually it's May 2-4 long weekend um, or even that June 1st. So we have a planting ceremony um, and then in the fall we have harvesting ceremony. So we bring the community, we all come together, we all harvest together, we food share and then we feast of course, we always feast. Um, so yeah, there are specific ceremonies and one of the most important ceremonies and I should have started with this, is our Nibi, our water. So this is a copper vessel. Um, when we carry our water in copper vessels, when we um, sing for the water, we pray for the water, and we carry it in a copper vessel, we change the molecular structure of the water. We're cleansing the water. And that's really important for us as First Nations communities because we don't have a lot of clean drinking water in our communities. So there's um, water songs, there's water ceremonies, and we sing and we pray for the water. And this is the water that we soak our seeds in and we pray for those seeds and then we get them germinating and then we plant them into Mother Earth. So even digging up that ground is a ceremony that we're now digging into Mother Earth. So we pray to Mother Earth. As we put those seeds in and we sing for this water and we put that water on those seeds and then we cover it again and we pray for it. And there's a teaching about walking softly on Mother Earth for the faces that have yet to come. Those are that plant uh, family. Those are our plant medicines that are coming. Um, and also just, um, so yeah, we do have planting ceremonies, harvesting ceremonies, uh, water ceremonies, um, everything we do, even just picking up that little bit of sema and tobacco um, and offering that as ceremony. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for the question, Jessica. Yes, so keep you. them coming. If anyone else has any, just pop in and ask away. And then in the meantime, let's continue talking about wild rice. Sure. Um, so the wild rice, there was a teaching um, that we've been given that um, Creator reached out to first man. So Anishinaabe, when we break that down in our language, um, when first person came to the earth. Um, and so when we break down our language, that's what that means. So we were lowered to the earth. Um, they say that our origin started along the east coast. Um, people talk about the Bering Strait and things like that. And we say, no, that's not our teachings and that's not where we come from. And um, that's, you know, someone's uh, philosophy of where they think we came from. But we know that um, our teachings, our origin started on the east of Turtle Island um, and that we migrated uh, to the west. And Creator told the Anishinaabe people to follow the flow of the water to the seven stopping places of the Anishinaabe. And so there's different stopping places right from the East Coast right through and they say that the last of the seven stopping places is Madison or near, sorry, uh, Wisconsin and Madeline Island. And Madeline Island is actually in the shape of a turtle in, of, in the shape of Mazike. And it's wild rice territory. So that's White Earth Reservation, I believe, through that territory. So um, wild rice is a sustainable um, commodity that they grow and and they sell there and they use that as an economic driver within their community um, mm -hmm. and that's what we'd like to see here within our communities that resurgence and repatriation of the rice beds and being able to have a sustainable economy through the rice beds mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so the seven stopping places of the Anishinaabe there are gathering places all across this territory um, and I think um, that was lost during the reserve systems because as settlers were arriving, then legislation was put in place that we could no longer travel freely through our territories. Um, we were herded into reserve systems. There was a past system where we weren't even allowed to leave the reserves. Um, there was Indian agents who brought us sugar, flour, milk, and salt. The okay. foods, right? Which we find really harmful to our systems and our bodies. We see high rates of diabetes in our communities. Um, they they took away hunting and fishing rights at one point. Now we've we've uh, fought and regained all those rights. Um, for me, I've never given them up, but 
Um, so just looking at all this legislation that was imposed on us as Indigenous people to travel freely through our territories, to be able to, to, be able to hunt, fish, and sustain ourselves through um, that traditional knowledge base around the foods and the plant systems, that was outlawed and taken from us. And, right. you know, we have knowledge keepers that have held this um, teachings and, and hidden it even for so long. And, and now those teachings, um, this is what we call the eighth fire. Um, the seventh generation was about the resurgence and reclamation of our culture and seeing our young people picking up the language, picking up the ceremonies. The eighth fire has been lit and our communities are getting stronger and stronger and we're going back to ceremony. We're going back to the land. We're, we're seeing a lot of culture-based camps uh, popping up in Northern Ontario in these places that um, the government calls crown land, which is really traditional indigenous land. So uh, we have a camp up north. We have a medicine camp that we travel to. Um, there's another one, Nimki Ashkabong, which is all about culture and high tanning and harvesting and sustainable ways and, and just living off the grid, really, um, which is what we've all been doing um, for a long time prior to um, colonization. So it's just really important that, you know, we have this connection to our food and it comes from the land and our ceremonies, our language, everything is about land base. Um, I think when... Um, legislation was put in place around our ceremonies. When I talk about ceremony, it's as simple as offering that sema to a plant and giving thanks for that plant. And when we say ceremony, people think religion or they think something that's different from, and there's a fear around that. And so right. then it's outlawed. And really understanding that everything I have in my bundle, everything that I carry in my medicines, all comes from the earth. There's nothing here that can hurt anyone. And I think without knowledge and understanding, there was no wisdom around the knowledge base that we carried. So it was just outlawed. And they said, no, you can't speak your language. You can't harvest medicines. You can't hunt and fish anymore. We're going to put you here. And this is what's good for you. And here's those four foods. So yeah. when I think at our beautiful, magnificent foods and our wild rice and and our plant medicines and all of those wild foods that we have to be given flour, sugar, salt, and milk, right? Yeah. They just really just did so much damage to our food systems and our genetics over, over all these years. So just getting back to those, um, reclaiming those food systems. Yeah, it's such an extreme from really nutrient dense, um, high quality food that nourish your body, um, and it sounds like all the things that, uh, like the traditional foods that you were consuming are things that is everything that you need. Yes. Um, you know, the wild rice, the, uh, the corn, the squash, like it, it carries every, um, like has all the vitamins and nutrients, the minerals that we need, and especially the wild game. Um, yes. That fat that's found in the wild game is full of essential fatty acids. And, and then the fish as well. So both of those have those things that you need to survive. And, you know, at, you know, at York Region Food Network and myself personally, like there's just such a strong connection between who you are and what you eat. And uh, just even the thought of that is really difficult for me because I know, um, you know, it's, it's what, like you took food that was full of life and that identified who you are. And when you take that away, um, and are given something else and, and what you're given was completely the opposite of what you had. It's food that no one really should be eating. And then that's all you had to sustain. It's like, that's a really, you know, it's a challenging, um, it's a challenging thing to like concept to just hear really. And, um, and to understand because we are so rooted in our food and around ceremonies and around feasting and around festivals and what foods we enjoy in those places. Um, so it's more than that. It's like, you can't do anything that identifies you as being you. Right. And so I, that's what I'm hearing from you. And it's, it's, it's interesting. So yeah, if you want to speak more to that. I just, I think that our ceremonies and our prayers and our lodge where some people may find that fear-based or, or really like, oh, what are they doing? Um, one of my elders said, when we begin to pray and we begin to drum and we be begin to sing, Canadians and settlers think we're talking about them or we're, we're doing something or conjuring, I've heard a lot. Like people say they're conjuring the devil and I'm like, we don't even have the devil in our teaching. So that's <laughs> a colonial-based thing. That's, we don't even have that. So that's not my knowledge base. But I think when we pray and we sing, it's for Mother Earth. We're singing for plants. We're singing for the four-leggeds. We're singing for the swimmers. We're singing for the crawlers. Creator created everything, and it has a reason for being here. 
Um, and I think the human nation is the only one that's really straight from those original teachings of creator. Everything else is doing what they're supposed to be doing. We aren't doing that. And we've really done a lot of damage to mother earth. And I think, I think people need to really educate themselves so that our prayers aren't here to hurt anyone. They're not, mm -hmm. they may be different from, um, but really I think there's a lot more similarities between all of the nations than there are differences. And I think people need to put that stuff aside that things are different from doesn't mean that they're less than or better than um, we're just different and that's absolutely okay creator made us different but we are yeah. all the nation people and we all just come from a different direction so I just yeah. think once people have knowledge and understanding when I talk about ceremony I'm talking about mother earth I'm talking about our land I'm talking about giving thanks I'm talking about that gratitude of everything that's been given to us and I think mm -hmm. more people need to live that way you know we're yeah. not you know, even the term consumer, right? We're consuming everything. I'm not a consumer, you know, I live in balance with Mother Earth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good point as well. You know, um, just uh, even looking at, uh, we all, you know, again, this COVID-19 situation really highlights how we are exactly the same because we're all responding dep no matter where we are in the world. Everyone responds in the same way. We all feel the same way when we're isolated. We all feel the same way when we have fear, um, we feel the same way when we see someone else hurt, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we, you know, so like, you know, as human beings, we do often respond very similar to each other in crisis situations and in joy, joyful situations. We respond very similarly as well. So um, yeah, I think that's a good point as well. Just kind of bringing up that we might, things might look different, but ultimately, um, just having that sort of overall respect for that um, is, is really important. I think people need to really understand that before colonization, before settlers even came here, we had seven canopies of food. We weren't a starving nation. And I yeah. hear that a lot in the history books. And, you know, we were starving and thank goodness the settlers arrived and saved us and, and things like <laughs> that. It's like, that's not quite the story we tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we did have seven canopies of food. We have all of our water medicines and our water grasses. We have our mosses. We have our barks. We have our wood. Um, even if we look at the trees and the standing tree nation that's around us, you know, we had oak that was producing food. We have maple. Um, and then as more and more settlers arrived and we needed building materials, um, they started eradicating those uh, wood lots and, and creating things like pine that isn't really, you know, a food supplier. Uh, we do have white pine tea, which we're using during COVID right now. White pine tea is one of our healing um, medicines that we're using that they say that will boost our immune system. And it's also a respiratory cleanser and puller. So white pine okay. tea is actually one of the medicines that I'm using now, um, mm -hmm. as well as cedar tea. I have cedar tea every day, all day though. So I, I'll talk more about that. But um, yeah, our, we have seven canopies of food. We were not starving. Um, and even our food preservation and even our food preparation. So I've cooked on, um, what do you call them? The uh, underground ovens where mm -hmm. we've dug a big hole and we put all of our coals and rocks and then we put uh, wet grasses and then we put all of our roasts and meat. Then we cover them all again with more grasses and then we covered them with dirt and we walked away for the day and we built our teepees and we built our lodges and we did our prayer ceremonies. And then when we came back in the afternoon, we unburied um, that earth and all of the beautiful foods were there cooked in Mother Earth. So oh. <laughs> even that connection, it was, it's just stunning and it's beautiful. What a beautiful way of life that we live. And so just understanding how beautiful and grateful I am to have that life and to be able to have that knowledge, to be able to cook underground in Mother Earth and do it in such a good way. And yeah. everything we need to survive, Mother Earth has put here. So this COVID might have a bit of an impact on us, but understanding that we have knowledge and we have teachings that will get us through this. Yeah. The chef in me is very excited about that concept. I've never actually done, um, I've, I've been to a hungi, which is, uh, I guess, like a um, New Zealand version of that, where, yeah. where the, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, the, uh, like a hole's dug, the animal or the meat is put in there and then it's covered. Um, and so that's been, that was a great experience. So is this something that you still practice now, doing this, um, this way of preparing meat? Yeah, we do. We have done it um, at different ceremonies, depending on where we are. Um, like I said, we have a camp up north on Bark Lake. Um, yeah. So we want to do a big feast this summer, depending on COVID, of course. 
Mm -hmm. um, we want to do a big feast up there because it's really important to, especially after COVID, that we give thanks because this is a teachable moment for so many people. And if we really look at our impact as the human nation and the two leggeds on Mother Earth, now that we're all in our space and that we're yeah. not taking up all this other space, the four leggeds are coming back in areas that they've never been before. If we look at Venice, they say that the dolphins are now, you know, coming through the rivers and the waterways. And we've we've been on those gondolas in Venice and you couldn't see through the water. It was black and murky. And even my daughter and I sang when we were in Italy and prayed for that water because we couldn't see through it. We couldn't yeah. and you know it's turning blue again. And and so really looking at the impact that we as the human nation have done on Mother Earth and all that consuming and and everything, you know, we're taking this step back away from moving faster and faster and faster. What are we moving to? You know, what are we going towards? Mm -hmm. I think Canadians mm -hmm. and, and people all across um, the earth everywhere just need to take time to breathe, take yeah. care of yourself, look after what's in our space as far as our families and, and our health. And we're giving Mother Earth a break. Yeah. And this is that time of rebirth and that time that she's able to actually breathe in and get that fresh breath of air. And because we've done so much to her and really understanding our impact and that ecological footprint that we have been stamping all over Mother Earth. And mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. seeing it all across. Um, we're seeing it in our water. Um, when we sing and pray for the water, we know that our water is in trouble around the earth. Um, you know, looking at the Amazon and all the fires that were happening. Um, they say that like, and you don't have to be a scientist, but I remember photosynthesis and the yeah. air, the oxygen coming from the plant life. So the Amazon forest with all of that plant life is the lungs of mother earth. Mm -hmm. That's where the majority mm -hmm. of our oxygen all around the earth comes from the Amazon forest. So when we're understanding that the majority of that is being burnt, that's affecting our airways here in Canada. It's affecting our airways all around the earth. Understanding that there's sacred places all over Mother Earth. For Canada, we have one of the largest last fresh water sources in the world. Yeah. The lakes. And yeah. understanding the impact that we as the human nation, you know, they're talking about nuclear storing nuclear waste under the Great Lakes. You know, they have, um, you know, a lot of the populations are all around the Great Lakes. Like when we look at inner cities and different things, the majority of the populations are coastal around the Great Lakes and, uh, and around um, the waterways. When Mother Earth causes those great changes, if there's a flood or if there's anything that it's greatly impacting our people everywhere, yeah. not indigenous, every, every human nation person is going to be impacted. So what are we doing? Um, and are we sustaining and holding that sacred water in a good way? Mm -hmm. or, you know, and all of us have a voice as Canadians. And if they're going to put nuclear waste underneath the Great Lakes, knowing that's the largest last fresh water source in the world, where yeah. is Canadians outrage? That's I've grown up knowing the Great Lakes. I've known all my life that, you know, look at this beautiful, pristine water. Um, even our water walkers, we did a water walk through um, Lake Erie. And when they took that water, it was really putrid and polluted and thick, almost like a gel was a oh, long wow. way in edge. The women sang for it. They prayed for it. They walked for four days and they drank from those copper vessels. And a scientist actually took that water under a microscope, under a microscope and we changed the structure of that water through prayer, wow. through ceremony and through our connection to Mother Earth. And sadly, we as Indigenous women, um, in our news, we see the MMIW, the fact that we're missing and going missing at an alarming rate. Who's going to sing those water songs? Who's going to pray for that water? Who's going to mm -hmm. have that connection to Mother Earth? Because we as Indigenous women in this territory have those songs and teachings to clean that water and to protect that water. Mm -hmm. And sadly, that voice has been negated for so long. So mm -hmm. people really need to understand that that connection and our prayers and our ceremonies are not to be feared, but to be revered and that we know those songs and teachings to cleanse the water and clean the air. Mm -hmm. and it's really, really important, those connections with all of us as human nation, that yeah. we all have a role and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that, for sure. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of meat <laughs> uh, to be in our conversation. 
So I'm just curious if, so at this time, okay, so we're almost at 12 o'clock. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please do pop on. And I'm wondering though, if you have any more, just like um, cooking techniques or uh, actually, yeah, like any cooking techniques or just um, things that you do around food that you'd like to share. Sure. So um, another main staple for my wild rice, and this is a hot dish that I do, and it's really basic, and it's just a wild rice casserole. Um, garlic, celery, and onions, which is our basic in any soup base or anything. Um, mm -hmm. I usually will um, steam them or baste them with a little bit of um, uh, cooking oil, mm -hmm. um, and I just fry them up, and then I add my boiled wild, wild rice to that, and I actually just fry it up like a big casserole dish. And mm -hmm. it's really quick, easy, fast, efficient and the vitamins and nutrition in it are so much better than just like plain white rice kind of thing yeah. that, that nutritional value um and so that's one of our main staples is that uh wild rice casserole which is a nice hot dish does um, it go into the oven afterwards or do, is it just um i i do it like both ways. sometimes i'll just fry up the veggies ahead of time sorry i'm just gonna shut my phone off um i fry up my veggies ahead of time and then i um just add my hot rice and stir it up and then we can serve it that way other times I'll just kind of soften the veggies a little bit and then throw it all in a pan in the oven and cover it or put it in there on uh, my pit. We'll put a big tray in the pit and cover it with yeah. dirt. And then it just steams all day and, and it's just so beautiful. So wild rice yes. to me is so versatile. I use it in, in a lot of dishes and especially our soups and you know, it's summertime, so not so much. Um, but yeah, a lot of our soups, always my bases. I don't use too much starches like potatoes or, anything I use my wild rice and, okay. and wild rice water is actually a healer okay so I want to talk a little bit about that because there's yeah. so much healing properties within our food so um, part of my ceremonies I am a pipe carrier and I'm a sun dancer which means that we forego food and water for four days and okay. there's ceremony around that um, because of our health now um, the ceremonies have changed over the generations because with diabetes and hypoglycemia and different things that are affected because of our non-connection to food, um, our elders and the helpers that are there have to make sure that we are healthy, that um, nobody gets hurt um, in the sense of going foregoing food for four days. So one of the things when I was feeling really sick and I wasn't feeling well on my third day of not eating, um, they said wild rice water. And wild mm -hmm. rice water has all the nutrients. So most people, when they're cooking, will just throw that water out. For me, I preserve my wild rice water. I have it in little uh, bags and it's frozen. So I would never throw that out. I would never let it just wash down the drain. So okay. wild rice water is a main staple in our diet for healing. So even now during COVID, um, every time I'm cooking with my wild rice, I save that wild rice water and I use it in my soup stocks. I use it in everything. And if not, then I just actually drink it. I'll take a, a shot glass or not a shot glass because I don't have those, but like a little mm -hmm. uh, glass and I just drink it. And sometimes it's a little, um, I don't know, it's not the best tasting always, but it depends where we're from. <laughs> well, sometimes it's got a bit of a muddy taste because of the territory it comes from. Okay. But um, so I'm always drinking that wild rice water and yeah. just understanding that there's a healing with that that comes with okay. that. Well, um, the other things that I collect and I go harvest all the time is rose hips. Mm -hmm. so, rose hips are, I mean, you can find them, I find them wild growing. Um, so these rose hips, I actually make uh, rose hip tea. Sorry, okay, my, yeah. Sorry, my camera's a little. So I harvest those. When I harvest again, I offer my sema and I pray for them, but I make rose hip tea. So even the color of them, um, this is like a blood cleanser. And it's also good for your heart. So um, rose hip tea. Um, so I soak this, um, rehydrate them, and then I drink that tea. And I might add a bit of maple syrup or honey. Um, but this has got such a beautiful uh, pungent taste. I do rose hip and sweetgrass tea. Okay. So I have the beautiful sweetgrass. So the sweetgrass is representative of the hair of Mother Earth. Um, okay. The sweetgrass was harvested from this territory. Um, so Curve Lake has a lot of wild rice growing all around the Peterborough area. Um, so this wild rice for me represents body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. That walk in balance with Mother Earth that we have, um, that we're very um, connected to body, mind, and spirit. So many of us as Anishinaabe people or Red Nation people, you'll see us all wearing our hair in braids. We're honoring Mother Earth. That, and okay. that's telling people that when you see us, that we are walking in balance with Mother Earth. That's what that so means. So our braids, our, our braids and our hair 
there's teachings around that. We would never just cut our hair or cut our braids off. And actually, if you see someone cut a braid off, it's because we're in mourning. If we lose someone very sacred or, or connected to us, part of yeah. that grieving ceremony is we would cut our braid off and we would offer mm -hmm. to the Is this sweet grass? Is this sweet grass the um like is that from the wild rice? No, no, this is a oh. different plant medicine. So we, uh, not only do we have four sacred foods, we have four sacred plant medicines. Mm -hmm. So sweet grass, cedar, tobacco, and sage. So those are our four sacred medicines here on Mother Earth. So this sweet grass, I do sweet grass and rosehip tea in the mm -hmm. summertime. And yeah. that's the main staple. Um, I also do uh, lavender coffee. So I'm a coffee girl. I have to have my coffee, but I actually do lavender coffee. So I grow okay. all my own organic lavender, then I dry right. it, and then I make a nice lavender infusion, and then I use that in my coffee pot. So I have coffee oh, okay. lavender. Um, sometimes you do like the iced coffee, and then I put whipped cream, which probably isn't a main staple, but we just like it. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you so, know what? It's all about balance, right? <laughs> right. So yeah. So um, knowing that our medicines, we can use as teas, and everything that we take into our body, we do in a good way. Um, so also our sage, which is our women's medicine. And so um, this big bag of sage that I carry, this is our buffalo sage. Um, so I smudge with it. I cook with it. Um, I actually have organic sage. It's cooking sage that I grow that's different from my buffalo sage. Um, but we do um, sage tea and also mm -hmm. sage water um, for anybody that struggles with like graying hair or anything. Our mm -hmm. sage water, they say you put it in a squirt bottle and you spray sage. And okay, it's, ladies. It turns, <laughs> turns your hair back to its normal color, right? It somehow does something with the tannins in your hair. So there's just so many teachings and so many gifts from all the different um, foods that we have. So this food here, I don't know if any of you could recognize what this is, but this is actually chaga. So this is one of our okay. superfoods. So everybody's yeah. talking about chaga right now, and you're seeing it everywhere. This actually is a fungus or like a... Um, a I, don't think it's a mushroom but it comes it grows on the sides of birch bark trees so this is actually yeah. a really huge piece um i i've had people like i guess it's worth around like twelve hundred dollars they tell me i was gonna say that looks like pretty substantial there <laughs> yeah that's no i yeah and then you don't see it in in um big batches like that so i actually have little ones so these little ones i know that they're selling them online for a lot of money i don't really sell my medicines that way that's not the way i work yeah. But um, I carry them with me. And so this chaga root, um, it's a blood purifier. So anybody with diabetes, it's also good for your heart. So anybody with heart issues. So I actually just have a little cheese grater and I just mm -hmm. grate it into like my teas, my soups, my omelets, everything. Chaga goes into everything. Um, so I don't really struggle with cough, cold or flu very often. Um, so what's the flavor it, profile like what's the flavor profile uh, like? it's almost like a mushroom like it's kind of like that fungus that's why I said I'm not sure if it's a mushroom but it's very much and I also use this so when we do our fire our sacred fire I don't use a lighter I okay. I'll either use wooden matches and I use those wooden matches to strike my chaga and then this piece mm -hmm. of chaga would go in as my fire starter mm. so nothing nothing foreign will go into that fire it comes from the plant medicine. So we light this on fire and put that into my sacred fire. So everything's interconnected. Wow. Um, there's our yeah. foods. Um, Before you go on, I have a question, sure. Suzanne. Can I pop one Absolutely. in here? Yes. Okay. So it says, hi, Suzanne. You've talked so much uh, both about water and food. I was wondering if you could talk more about the connection between water and food. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Absolutely. So my most important teaching for anyone all around Turtle Island is water is life. Menewachone, water is life. Everything comes from the water. All of our plant medicine, all of us as human nation, we're made up of 80% water, 20% mineral. What happens mm -hmm. to the water happens to us. All of our medicines, all of our four-leggeds, all of our flyers, all of our swimmers, everything depends on water to live, to survive. That's why, and I, I don't want to talk political and I don't want to get political, but understanding that people across the nation, across Turtle Island are protectors. We're not protesting. We don't want government funding. We don't want anything. We want clean drinking water for our communities. Mm -hmm. Just before this COVID, there was dissension across the nation around indigenous people protecting their land base and protecting our waterways. And I think, again, we really have to change that conversation of what Canadians are being taught about who we are because 
we need to protect the water because our life depends on the water. And we have a water song, a Nibi song. And the water song is water we see you, water will respect you, and water will protect you. And this water song is gone international around Mother Earth. Um, from my grandmother, Josephine Mandaman, who was a water carrier, water walker. She was a 70-year-old grandmother who just passed this past year. Um, mm. And she created such an impact across Turtle Island that many of us now are water carriers and water protectors. And we carry this copper vessel and we carry our copper vessels and we walk the waterways. So this 70 year old grandmother with hip replacement and knee replacement walked the St. Lawrence Seaway. She's walked coast to coast. She's walked every great lake in this country. She wow. walked Mississippi singing and praying and teaching all of us as indigenous people the importance of water mm -hmm. and it's important that this is not an indigenous base teaching it's for all the nations red black mm -hmm. yellow and white that we all have a role and responsibility to protect this water because we depend on it um our bodies depend on it all of our medicines all of our foods everything comes from the water and if we don't protect the water we're going to be in serious trouble and every time that they're um, drilling for oil or fracking the amount of water used to bring that oil to the surface is 10 times the amount of the oil that's produced and okay. as much as we can divest from fossil fuels and oil and gas and those types of things there is never and no replacement for water there's no mm -hmm. replacement for water and people see it as a commodity to mm -hmm. buy sell to consume for us it's life water is life and yeah. really that is our most important message to everybody across the world mm -hmm. and looking at our communities with no clean drinking water um you know that we've been herded into these desolate areas of reserves that have no clean access to water things like that really understanding 500 years of impact of no clean drinking water now that that resurgence of culture and repatriation and that eighth fire has been lit, our young ones sing those water songs. Cedar's grown her whole life with that water song and protecting yeah. the water and knowing the importance of that water and our ceremonies and everything that is connected to that water. And I think that when we know that water has spirit, when we know that we can change the molecular structure of water and heal it with our songs and our connection and our prayers, I think that that knowledge is invaluable and Canadians really need to understand their ecological footprint on water and what mm -hmm. are we doing. Um, you know, when we turn that tap on the morning and we're brushing our teeth, are we leaving that tap just running and that water's just wasting away? You know, we turn that tap on, wet our toothbrush, shut it off, and then we sit or we'll put a little bit in a cup and then that's that water we use. How many times are people just turning that tap on and just leaving that water running? You know, it, it really bothers me when I see people with their big lawn systems and irrigation systems so that they can have greener grass than the Joneses next door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, they, you know and, and knowing that there's water restrictions in different areas and people, well, I get to water my lawn because I want that beautiful, bright green lawn. Do we need to waste that water on that bright green lawn or could we be utilizing that water for growing foods or sustainability and, and things like that? So I just think we really need to change our mindset that we are just consuming this this thing that mm -hmm. water is life water is everything to us in our communities and really understanding that connection yeah yeah no thank you so much for that answer um all right did we want to i know so you were going to show me something else uh before i i um interjected um, with the question yeah just have... something, sure let me just grab some more of my medicines here okay just moving my drum so, so um, our medicine, so this is uh, bear root. And so bear root, um, another thing that we do, and a lot of our teachings come from the four leggeds. So mm -hmm. we have bear root, and bear root's a really um, powerful uh, medicine, but we cook with it, we hold ceremonies with it, we drink it. Um, and somebody asked me, how do you know about the healing properties of this uh, bear root? And I said, our elders used to watch the animals. And a long, long time ago, um, Canada has a huge beaver population and it actually became overpopulated with beaver. 
um, and then got really, really sick. Um, and there was diseases and stuff happening because they were becoming so um, overpopulated. Um, and then they started to be uh, commercially harvested and uh, people started utilizing them. When the beavers got sick, the elders started watching the beavers and the beavers were going way, way down into the swamps and they were pulling up this little tiny root and it's the last, so I've gone out harvesting bear root. So we go out in a canoe and we go way into a really swampy area and we're actually pushing our canoes through with the paddles or oars because it's so thick and muddy, you can't even like get the canoe through. And then right. we lean over one side of the canoe and the person that's harvesting leans over the other and we have to go way down up to where like shoulders digging down to the bottom of the roots into the mud and it's the bottom six inches of that root is where the medicines are. Wow. And, and so harvesting that bare root is a ceremony, giving thanks to that beaver is a ceremony, but we learn from them. They taught us mm -hmm. about the healing property of that. So there's other water um, medicines and foods um, everywhere, even, uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, bulrush willows? We use those for flour, you know, that if you pound them, like, uh, what did they call them, bulrushes? Yeah, bulrushes. Yeah. So, yeah. So there, you can make bulrush flour, the stems, you can uh, pound them down. And yeah. Actually there's, they're a food source, right? Really? Yeah. And so we do like, uh, yeah, we do pancakes out of them. We mix them with water and create like a flour. And so there's so much out there. Uh, Is there flour. gluten in that flour? <laughs> um, I would think not. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't really a thing for us, right? So I don't know. Yeah. Most of our, our foods are, are around the natural base. I'm not sure about that. But I'll, so I have um, traditional indigenous cookbooks that I want to share some of those and I'll actually print them out properly and then I'll share them and then you can share them all over the Food Network page. Um, oh, great. But we Thank have you. traditional uh, cookbooks from elders. Um, there's uh, one that just has been eluding me around milkweed soup. So mm. milkweed soup is an old 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 teaching around that milkweed soup but there's also toxins in some of our foods if we don't prepare them in the right way so we have to have right. knowledge and understanding in order yes. to move forward in wisdom so i'm not suggesting people just go out and start picking bowl <laughs> and cutting them up and throwing them in your frying pan there's um it takes, education and it, takes, it takes an education um and knowledge to be able to learn and yeah. so i've spent hours and hours um days and days with different elders and different traditional people in different areas um, so just even on Georgina Island, spending that time over there, we have wild ginseng, we have wild garlic, we have, uh, um, wild, um, what's the green stuff we put on baked potatoes? Chives, chives. So we have wild chives, we have wild garlic, we have wild ginseng, all different stuff that's growing that are all just natural. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else that we eat out there that, that is plant medicine, um, that we getting up. Um, yeah, just some of our tea. So I, I want to talk a little bit about cedar because mm -hmm. we drink a lot of cedar tea in our home. My daughter's incidentally named cedar, um, but cedar is a polar medicine. So cedar is used, it clears our airways okay. and we actually drink cedar tea every day. Um, we have a big pot of cedar boiling on our stove, especially so during COVID, cedar pulls impurities out of the air cedar is a polar medicine and it takes all those toxins so when i'm cooking um if i'm like we were someone was doing renovating we had drywall so that dust was in the house so i yeah. kept pots of cedar boiling not only in my kitchen but i kept one in the back on a little separate burner because it pulls all that dust out of the air mm -hmm. um, but when i have a big pot of cedar on the stove i don't drink from that one that one's pulling everything and putting okay. everything so i leave that one on the stove and it boils and it steams my house and it cleans the air I also have a small little pot that's a medicine pot that I drink from. So I take okay. a couple of cedar boughs. So I go out to my cedar tree. I go out and I offer my tobacco. Sometimes I'll sing and I'll pray for that. And then I bring that cedar in and I take just the green boughs of it. So this is cedar right here. Um, so I just take the green boughs. I actually, when they say clean your cedar, so I don't have any of the, whoops, I don't have any of the green stem. It's all just the little green leaves. Okay. And um, I put that into a pot of water. Um, I only take a, like a little pinch of it and I put it in two cups of water and I boil it for about two to three minutes. Then I remove the cedar. And it's very important that you remove the cedar because when we boil it all day and over and over again, there's like a, 
uh, film that goes to the top of it and that can become toxic. So okay. that's why I said when I have my big pot boiling all day, that's pulling impurities out of my air. And then I'll take that water and I'll go dump it at the end of the day out by the fire. Um, okay. For my cedar tea that I drink, I have a separate pot for and I only boil it for two to three minutes. Then I remove the cedar and then I drink that cedar water. I drink that cedar mm -hmm. tea. Cedar's been drinking cedar water since she was a little baby in her baby bottle. So when oh, I was wow. in Toronto, and here's my poor girl on the subway with me, and she's got this water bottle that looks like dirty putrid water with sticks <laughs> in it. But it was cedar water. And I can't tell you how many looks I got. And people were like, what is she drinking? And, and people were like, wow, yeah. Um, but it, and it looked like dirty putrid water, but it's actually cedar tea. And yeah. It's so good for you. And it's just, it's an antioxidant. It has vitamin C. Um, so many beautiful um, nourishing things that we get from our cedar. So we do cedar in everything. And so we do do cedar tea with honey, maple syrup. Um, that's another main staple in our house. So just understanding that so these are some of those foods that people don't really look at as a food source, like even our wild rice. When I talk about our beautiful wild rice casserole with cranberries and maple syrup, to look at wild rice as a dessert, you know, just um, getting out of that box kind of thing. So. Well, I'm excited to try that. And uh, um, beginning next week, it's going to be, you know, we're going to be starting our food production again, and that is going to be our treat. So I'm going to try to do that. I'll, I'll try to make you proud. <laughs> yeah, we'll send you some of our recipes. And, and when we can, uh, you know, get away from this social distancing, maybe we can get up to the camp and do that like pit cooking and you can come and spend an experience up there. And so we have teepees and lodges up there. We have um, off the grid camp. We have our own private beach and waterfront with clean water. Wow. Um, so we really mm -hmm. source from there. And then there's a lot of beautiful plant medicines around. So we do medicine walks, we harvest, and then we just feast and spend that time on Mother Earth. It is mm -hmm. really, yeah, we don't really advertise. It's not really a tourism space. We just gather as human nation. We invite yeah. them up and share our teachings and our food and our knowledge. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to look forward to that invitation later on. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> that's amazing. So we're just kind of winding down. It's just uh, like a court, court just, 18 after 12. So we have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, is there anything uh, that you'd like to share with us in that last 10 minutes? And again, if anyone has any questions, uh, this has been a, such an awesome uh, journey with Suzanne Smoke sharing her food story with us, um, her take as it from an Indigenous perspective. And uh, so we're just really excited to be hearing all that you, your knowledge that you're sharing, Suzanne. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, um, that you would like to ask. Now's our time. Um, otherwise, um, Suzanne, if there's anything further you'd like to share. Actually, I have one question. Sure. That honey and the maple syrup that you mentioned that you get from Georgina Island, is that something that we can purchase like, um, like just as just uh, like anyone can purchase or Absolutely. how can we get our hands on that? So if you go on to Facebook, I believe they have a couple of websites. So First Nations Cultural Tours, which is Jacob Charles. And I know he sells out fast every year because yeah. like I said, in our communities, it's like gold because we don't consume white sugar. So maple syrup um, from Jacob Charles from First Nations Cultural Tours. Um, I can provide you a link uh, for a phone number and contact information after that you can put out. And also oh, Darla Trumbull from Georgina Island Honey Company. So okay. right they're based as well. Um, one yeah. of our traditional feast foods that I talked really quickly about is our strawberries. And I know mm -hmm. that you and I spoke about our strawberries a little bit at length. So right now, this is what we call our flowering moon. This is the moon of this time. We also have a strawberry moon and we have a hunter's moon and sucker moon. And, and so we have a 13 moon calendar. Um, we're mm -hmm. not like a 12 month calendar that we put on the wall. We have 13 months and it's all connected to mother earth and the animals and the stages of the moon. So right now we're in that flowering moon. Right now, all of our berries and all of our things are starting to um, sprout and come up. So strawberries are a sacred feast food and strawberries, odamen is heart medicine. And if we look at our strawberries, they all come in different sizes and shapes, but they all replicate or um, look like a heart. And so mm -hmm. that heart berry um, is a traditional feast food. And so for our young women, when they are growing into womanhood, there is a berry ceremony that we have and that we hold for our women, um, for those young women. And those seeds that are on that strawberry represent the seeds of new life. 
And so there's layers upon layers of teachings that are women's teachings. So I won't share those now. Um, but understanding the sacredness of that old daemon, that strawberry, that heartberry. So right now, um, especially like when we go into winter, so when I worked at the school in different places, we always had cups of berries, all organic berries, and we cut them up and we give them to the kids every day, all day. Cedar is a berry girl. She has grown up in berries. Um, and I'm also sit with the bear clan. So I'm, up, I'm all about the berries. Um, mm -hmm. So we have berries in our diet every day. Um, their antioxidant, vitamin C, um, just a powerful uh, punch of vitamins and minerals that we need in our bodies. Blueberries. So I take a group of women from um, my, uh, the clients that I serve in domestic violence and human trafficking. We actually take them all to um, a berry farm and we all harvest and pick berries together. And then afterwards, when we gather again, I create a huge feast all based on berry dishes. So oh, wow. there's so much versat versatility around strawberries, um, blueberries, uh, even our cranberries, which is like Wada Mohawk territory, our cranberries have teachings. Um, but all of them working together um, have such a powerful antioxidant impact that everybody should be having berries during cold cough and flu season. Everybody should be mm -hmm. working those into their diets, mm -hmm. um, even how we're harvesting them. So that little green... Uh, spread at the top of the berries, we eat that. Yep. You see a lot of people take it off or cut it off and throw it away. That is really strong medicine, that little sprout that connects it from the strawberry to the vine. That little piece is super strong medicine. So we eat those. So you see many Anishinaabe people, when we serve our berries, it's a whole berry with that green sprout. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, don't, we don't waste anything, right? Yeah. And even when I look at, when I'm, I cringe when I'm at restaurants and I see the open kitchens and they cut that whole top of the berry off and there's that whole red piece of the berry in that green. That yeah. is medicine. That is medicine. That's the so medicine. We drink, yeah, we drink strawberry juice in our house. So we take berries and we just mush them through a sieve. I keep my seeds, my strawberry seeds, so we can replant but also okay. we mush it through a sieve and then we have strawberry juice. We just add water, water and strawberries. And that's oh. like a big staple in indigenous community, strawberry juice, mm. you, know, have, you know, fresh squeezed orange juice and grapefruit juice. Nishinaabe communities, it's strawberry juice. So it's strawberry just, juice, strawberry juice. Yeah. And any powwow, any public event that's open to the public, any powwow, you'll get strawberry juice. It's, oh. and if you haven't tried it, you have to try it. And uh, one thing that I do want to talk about really quickly is scone. People talk about fry bread and okay. that is not a traditional food. It comes from the fact that we overcame that colonization and that poverty of those four white foods. And we took right. something from nothing and we made it into a food staple. And mm -hmm. so some of our communities, that's all they had to live on was those four white foods. We didn't have any other, um, access to any other dietary foods once we were in that reserve system. So we took something from nothing and made it into something. And now we see it all over native country that we have fry bread and scone and, you know, who's our fresh, best fry bread maker. And we have contests in our communities and everything, but really it comes from a colonized version of those were the main staples that we were given. And we did something with them and we made something good of it. So just looking at that, like scone is not a traditional feast food. Um, yeah. It is implemented into our diets in some of our communities. For me and Cedar, we've kind of um, taken that. We do baked scone with whole wheat uh, flour. We don't use white processed flour. We don't use right. sugar. Um, we'll, um, we don't use much salt in our cooking ever either. So just um, the, the herbs and stuff that we use, we stay away from those four main staples if we can. And you know, um, it's just like, it's just a testament though of our resilience though, of human nature's resilience that, um, you know, out of nothing mm -hmm. that you were able to create something. So there's a little bit of bittersweet to that reality. Um, yeah. yeah. How it's like, you know, something that becomes a staple in our diets was born from something that, uh, wasn't you know, this wasn't an ideal situation, but it just goes to testament to testify to like your resilience uh, as a community and as a people, um, you know, in sort of mainstream culture, if we go like two days without fresh water, <laughs> you know, there, this will be an uproar. And uh, the fact that your community has endured that for hundreds of years, it's uh, again, it's just a testament um, to the resilience uh, of the community. Um, just over here, we just have um, on the chat. Um, so Morgan has shared those, 
those um, addresses that uh, you told us about. So to get yeah. our our honey and to get the uh, maple syrup from Georgina Island. So if anyone is interested, uh, those links are right there. Um, so we can uh, support the community while enjoying some liquid gold. <laughs> and so that's amazing. Suzanne, you're awesome. You are more than awesome. And I just want to say thank you so, so, so much uh, for coming, having this conversation with us all. Um, we're going to share this uh, through our social media and on our website. So even though we didn't have a, a large group here today, uh, we know that other people will definitely be able to participate and benefit um, in your wisdom. And so we thank you so much for coming and for sharing that with us. Jimmy, go ahead. I have, yes. And I have one question. Will you come back and cook with us one day? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to cooking with you. Um, yeah, I would like to bring some of my recipes. Maybe we can, once this COVID is over, we'll be able to cook together in your kitchen there. Um, yes. But yeah, hopefully that um, if I get some lighting in my kitchen properly. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's so much knowledge and connection in our food. And I think um, it's building right relationships with all our nations because we all need to feast. We all need to come together um, and understanding there's more similarities between us than there are differences. And we all have that beautiful gift to be able to consume and, and take that food. And I think just even having educational things like this, I hope each and every one of you, when you pick up that strawberry, really understand the importance and significance and how much more beautiful it's going to taste when we know that connection to the history same with our rice you know when you're going through that grocery store and you look at that minute rice that's quick and efficient and you know what what value is it and then right beside it is wild rice that we maybe have never tried before and really understanding the connection to williams treaty to the waterways and the areas that we come from this is a beautiful sustainable food source that drives the economy in first nations and that's one way of coming together as a nation is to be able to drive our economies um, and using good sustainable food sources that are good for us. So yeah. I thank you Miigwech for, for welcoming me here. I'm looking forward to doing more work. Absolutely. And you know, we all know that food is connection and the idea of feasting is kind of how we roll at uh, <laughs> York Region Food Network. It's like, it's the best place to bring all differences and come to sit at the table and, uh, and just share and learn and grow from one another. It breaks down barriers, um, things that, um, you know, we, we can look in our kitchens often and just see many different nationalities sitting together, uh, enjoying a meal and partaking. And so we look forward to, uh, whether we do it online, Suzanne, or when we do it in person, we look forward to that. Um, I'm hoping we can twist your arm at some point also for some sort of forging, uh, talk walk or something like that that'll make Jessica our urban agriculture coordinator very happy if you can um, help us in those areas as well because uh, sure. we just yeah like the, the 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 food the land and everything else is amazing and uh, you just bring such wonderful knowledge to that so thank you so much for that thank you and thank you everybody for joining in with us today miigwech yes you have uh, just a few thanks here um, just everyone was just saying thank you so much um, and lots of tidbits for us to take away. Mm -hmm. All right, so everyone, we're just gonna say thank you so much for coming, for joining, for being here. It was awesome time uh, just uh, with our very first food story and we're gonna have lots more food stories to come. Um, next, uh, our next food story is going to be on May 22nd at 11 o'clock to 12.30 p.m. Um, and that, uh, we have a special guest who's gonna be joining us that day, um, that's me. <laughs> so I will be sharing uh, with you about Afro-Caribbean culture, um, a little bit of Black history um, and about our food systems and about our culture and sort of like the origins of our food. So uh, we will throw, I think, are we going to put the link up here, Jessica? Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to put it up here, but that's okay. Otherwise, you can uh, pop on our Facebook page. Oh, not, sorry, not Jessica. I meant to say Morgan. <laughs> Um, but either way, we will uh, put it on our Facebook page uh, and we hope to see you again. So thanks so much, Suzanne. All right. And, thank you, uh, everyone. Have a beautiful day. You as well. Take care. All right. Take care.